Good day. This is um, Penny. I'm Penny Sophocles, and uh, I'm recording this um, uh, video interview today uh, under our banner of uh, Standing in Her Power. And I'm really delighted to welcome Lara Belzera. Um, I first met Lara 15 years ago. Amazing, amazingly enough. And uh, we've become very strong friends, even though we haven't seen each other for, for many years now uh, in the physical world. Um, she's been traveling the world. And um, rather than me introduce her, uh, I would very much like to uh, ask her to introduce herself. But firstly, just to sort of say a few words, Standing in Her Power is really, this is a series of videos that I'm uh, doing with what I consider to be some of the most powerful women I've ever worked with or known of in my career. And um, they've made a great impact um, in the world uh, by their life and uh, their stance in the workplace and the impact that they've had on people around them. And so I'm interested to hear um, their thinking, uh, their worldview and what has really made them uh, the people that they are. Because I think uh, as women, we're all look, always looking for role models um, of the kind of women that we could be and the kind of things that we would like to achieve in our lives. So, Laura, welcome. Thank you, Penny. It's a uh, pleasure to be here. <laughs> thank you. So perhaps um, uh, you could introduce yourself and um, tell our audience um, some things about yourself and, and uh, your career. Mm, great, Penny. Thank you a lot. Uh, yeah, we we met each other in 2004 and it was like right now it's 15 years and it was exactly in the middle more or less of my career because I had 27 years of uh, executive um, work. So a little before you, I was in Brazil and I was, um, I think, a simple woman who wanted just to be, to do something, to have a uh, a nice job to get married and have a normal life. But I started by the end working in Bayer uh, in 2000, sorry, in 1996, I think, yes. And then Bayer was the first company that sent me abroad. So with Bayer, I started an expat career. And uh, Funny enough, it was a German company, European company, where everybody advised me not to go to this company because it was a very like a male European company that a young female Latin woman would not be able to succeed. But by the end, it was in Bayer where I learned so many things and people trusted me and I was able to kind of open many doors for other women in the future also. So when we met, I was in Hungary too. It was 2003. Before this, I was in Germany and Portugal with Bayer also. Uh, in, in Hungary, it was the first uh, job that I had leading people was when they sent you to coach me to do better my work. And I have to tell Penny that because of your coaching, uh, I became the leader that I became because you just uh, kind of formed me in the direction that I was already formed as a human being because my mother uh, had a lot uh, there were so many similarities of the way that you coached me and the way that my mother raised me. And I went to this path of leading from the heart, believing in human beings and believing in myself. And these opened doors that were very beautiful for me. So in Hungary, I was also part of the association of the pharmaceutical companies. And then after Hungary, I went to Mexico where I was VP of uh, sales and marketing for uh, Latin America. And then after this, I went to Venezuela where I was uh, president, executive president of uh, 
Bayer Venezuela, the corporation. There also, I was the first female to have this position in Bayer in Latin America. And I was also then um, in the association, the Chamber of Commerce, uh, Venezuela and Germany. I was the first president, uh, first female president to be elected. So there were lots of positions that I had that I was the first female. Uh, after this, then I went to, uh, then Roche um, headhunted me uh, in Venezuela and then I became the GM in Venezuela for um, Roche. And myself and another colleague that is Priya, we were the first females also to be general managers for uh, Latin countries in Roche. And then after this, I went to India, where you know my story that I was there and I was in India. I, I wanted to work completely different and I was allowed to do. And it was super nice because I work at believing in human beings, believing in other people that wanted the same um, vision of helping patients. So this is a kind of long, but not exhaustive <laughs> summary of my career. <laughs> yeah, but it, 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 it's, a, it's a pretty impressive um, story. I, I think, you know, even at, at the most minimal description of it that you've given, Lara, I, I know that uh, you've broken, uh, you know, a, a, a lot of uh, ceilings, uh, as they say, you know, you, uh, you've broken the glass ceiling and you've achieved a great deal for women in any role that you've uh, that you've played uh, for Bayer and Roche and also in, in in the countries that you've operated. So I'm sure that you've uh, you've acted as a, a very powerful role model for for women that have that have worked around you. Um, so I, I'd like to thank you very much for, for for going there. I would really like to ask you some questions about um, where you started when you were you sort of said this actually when you were in your teens you, you the vision that you had about your life and what you might achieve um didn't seem to be so big you said you wanted to have a, no. a normal life so so what was that you know what what projections did you were you making when you were in your teens so it is funny penny because i think that very different from the way that you were that you were raised uh you, I, I know that you had lots of challenges for you to become who you are today. Uh, my, my parents, I see no difference between my brother and myself. So uh, we hadn't absolutely, so we could do anything. Right. So my, my mother was a Japanese female. Yes. And, and she graduated in medicine and she did med school and then she did other courses also. And she despite, I, I, although she was uh, raised in this Japanese family where of course the men are much more praised at this, that period even more, but uh, she was raised differently in Brazil and we also were raised different. So my mother, it was like, we had this contrast of my father being a Brazilian that had to fight a lot to become a medical doctor. He came from a very, a humble family and my mother uh, had lots of things that she could take from her parents mm -hmm. like culture or even the wealth and many things uh, but mm -hmm. then she was always telling that she wanted me to be happy right. and my father used to tell whatever you do you have to be the best so <laughs> it was kind of you know it, it was sometimes it was like okay so I can only be happy if I am the best Right. And for for a long time, this was a kind of given. So right. everything that I was doing, I had to do to be the best. And if there, were, if there was something that I thought that I would not be the best, I thought two times and I thought, okay, let's see where I would do much better. Right. So somehow I was raised in a way, it was comp competition, but it was much more to know what I am good at and try to strive in that area and finding happiness. So I was very fortunate to have this kind of, and it was like, uh, it, it, I didn't need anything material to be happy. So oh. happiness was different. Happiness was kind of being together with family, being with friends, doing well, feeling, feeling that you are valued, mm -hmm. that you are able to add value on things that you are doing. So when I started my career and when I was like, when I was like very young, for me, 
although I was ambitious and I wanted to have a good job, no, I, that time I wanted to, to, to also be a medical doctor. And I wanted to be a, a neurosurgeon. It's like, a, oh, it's like <laughs> so, yeah. was, so it's like I wanted to, and it was like. A, but for me, it was much more like to be like my parents because they always had patients that were so hell, uh, grateful uh, to them, and seeing the people so happy, thanking them for what they did for their lives so there there was this whole life that i was raised that i thought that this was the the, the reality and my vision at that time how i projected my life was a life that i would have a family i would have a job that i i like it i would be i would make my parents proud and i would be proud so somehow i didn't have like a I want, I don't know how many cars, I want so many promotions, I want, so it was much more, a much bigger picture that I had. And right. whatever would come, I, I wanted to make this work. I don't know if I, if you, if you, if I express myself well, but it was much more of not the what, but the how. The how, the how. And do, do, do you remember whether you, you seem to be saying that success for you was doing something well and being happy? And, and was, that was the only, seemed to be the only criteria of what success would look like. If you, if you, look, at, if you look at your life to date, do you think that, that you were successful against that criteria or do you feel that you're criteria for success has evolved over the years completely so i i i have to tell that what brought unhappiness to my life is to try to be the best in anything mm. uh, because there was a point that um nothing was enough because of course there are always people that are better than you Right. Yeah. And if you are always looking who is better than you or who is worse than you, you will be miserable from both sides. So then it was a period that I started to introspect a lot. And it was when I was in Hungary and, and you helped this journey. Probably you do not know, but I have to tell that you helped this journey a lot because at that period, I remember that my mother gave me this book, The Servant. Oh, that yes. that that basically is that leadership is love and the way that you were also guiding me it was like uh, i was 32 years old penny and i was like it was general manager of pharma in hungary i had never had anybody reporting to me and suddenly suddenly i was general manager of a company in another country while my goals was I wanted to be probably a marketing manager in Brazil for Bayer, and I never aspired for anything more than this. I was okay. And suddenly I was there, so professionally super successful. But then I started to think, is this exactly what I want? Mm. So my personal life was not going at the same pace as my professional life. Because it was this question of being happy, only being the best. Mm, yeah. But then suddenly I said, okay, either I changed the perspective of happiness or the perspective of best, being best in what? So right. somehow I continue with this striving for, for excellence, but not to be the best, like I want to be the best, the, the, the country that sells the most. I wanted to be the best leader in the sense, not comparing to to other people, but with myself and what is the value that I was adding in the lives of the people that I was leading. And somehow was like, I started to develop in Hungary, all of this spiritual um, learning that I started to bring to my life. And then I started a lot to think about meaning of life, meaning of work. And I was only happy when I knew that I was doing something meaningful. When I discovered this in my life and I started to try to bring this meaning to the people that were working with me, then was when I started to tell, I want to be the best bringing meaning to my 
my people, so they will be truly happy. And not, not this happiness that sometimes you will look back and tell, oh, what I did, I lost my life doing something that it's not really meaningful. Sure. So when I started to do this, then happiness and to be the best continue to be what I strived for, but they changed completely. I, I changed the perspective how to see happiness and being the best. Yeah, and it sounded like you then extended being happy to everyone that worked for you. Yes. You moved from being happy yourself to yes. actually, okay, so now I've got to make other people happy and, you know, create the environment mm. and the circumstance that they are happy too. Yes. Fascinating. Okay. Um, so um, if I ask you now to look at the projections that you made and the experiences that you've had, um, how many of what the experiences that you had could you ever have anticipated? And how many have been really fantastic surprises? Oh, Penny, I, I, I hope that I am not over, overestimating it, but I really believe that my life was much more of a surprise. And, uh, because my expectations were not big. Mm. And uh, mm. look, if I will, if I will look back, um, I am now with uh, 50 years old. I had the opportunity to choose a new life and uh, I had the financial freedom to start a completely new career at 50 years old. Um, I look back and I feel that I was very successful in my, my previous professional life. I had complications in my personal life, but today I have my kids and my, my husband. I am living in the house that I would like. And more than all of these, we are talking here. You know, I am being able to try to help beyond my scope of work only. I am being able to try really to make an impact in other people that I never thought that I could be able to do. And I would never dream because I would, if I, if my, myself, if Lara at 18 years old, somebody would tell, you will do this at 50 years old. I would tell, oh, I will have to work too much. What I have to do to, to arrive there. And, and you know, Penny, it was not, it was full of joy. Uh, it was not easy at all, but it was something that it was filled with joy. Right. Fantastic. So, um, so actually it, it feels like you, you didn't have that big projections, but, but the life that you have led has, has made you and has made you very much bigger, but also you've had a much bigger life than you can possibly have anticipated. Mm -hmm. Yes. One... Uh, but let me just make a remark. Yes. Although, okay, many people who will, who knows, people who know me and probably listen to me saying this. So even some teachers from the primary school, they would tell, this is not fully true. And why? Uh, because somehow in my head, I, I always strived for the best. So although I didn't have ambition for me, so for example, I give you just an example. Oh. Somehow I wanted a period, I wanted to be nun in the Catholic church. So I wanted to be nun. And a nun convinced me not to be because I, I, I would not be able to help everybody, but just people who believe in the Catholic church. Right. But at the same time, when I discovered that being a Pope, a woman could not be a Pope, I told, why? Why a woman cannot be a Pope? Why just men can be Pope? And then, and I remember that this was something 
that sometimes people joke and I joke that I didn't want to be a nun because I could not be a pope because I was a woman <laughs> or, or I wanted to be the first woman pope so I, I so it's although I didn't have ambition Penny it was and you always looked at the, to the top it's like yeah because I look to the top and I told I have to strive for this not okay. because of the fame or because of the ambition but because if this is the person who will be helping the other people and the maximum that you can go to help people is being a pope i want to be there the maximum that you have is to be a president to help people i want to be a president so places that i would not be able to go there first why can't i be there yeah. second why should i be there if i would not be able to be there helping people as others because i should have the same chance yeah. so i just wanted to be to make this remark because my ambition was different it was not because i wanted to be for the sake of being i looked the best and i wanted to be there because i knew that there is the place that you can help or that you can do something for anything Right. So, so I want to more make... people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but but it, it sounds like it wasn't something that you you put into you. It was something that was innate in you. It yes. Was either, it was either very good programming on your father's part, or it was it was totally innate in you, and it naturally sparked uh, when it when it had the opportunity. I think that it was a good programming from my mother and my father together. This diversity, <laughs> that's why the diversity is so important. Yeah. Because yeah. they both wanted something completely different. Right. And I found a way to do both. Right. You know, it's not either or. No, no. How, but however, you, 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 can't, you, you can't give the credit for what you have actually done to your mother and father. They laid the seed and you know what you've made of your life is really yours and your and your I was a good husband. student you were a good student yeah <laughs> uh, but, but boy were you not yes. just a student you were you know a life uh, practitioner in, yes, in, yes in all of those area um so if I was to ask you um about the journey that you've made what would you say were the kind of prime or key turning points um for or, or either the key turning points or the kind of uh, accomplishment points for you okay so i think that one accomplishment point was going to hungary as a general manager of uh, pharma there um because uh for me it was like a given that uh, if you do a good work you would be recognized and you would like uh, have the job but at the same time I knew how difficult it was. And at that time, when my boss believed in me, 32 years old, a Latin that was working in Germany, in, Germ in, in, in Germany, and it was like, there were lots of men there, but he trusted in me. So I think that what I would tell that changed completely my life, was having a person that it was a German. He was 60 years old and he was retiring and he chose me to be, to take care of a country that it was in a very important moment that had to change many things. It was in a transition point. This belief made me believe in myself and made me you start to see things differently. And then a very big commitment and responsibility started to come. Right. And then I was also afraid to disappoint. It was one point that came with it and it is the price of it. But at the other point, the commitment that I had to this boss and as I grew older, my appreciation for this boss was increasing hugely because at that time, against all the odds, he believed in me. Right. But this was something that's why for me, Penny, today, one of the things that I praise the most and I work with all the leaders when I am 
uh, helping them to develop, I tell one thing that you have is that you have to believe in absolutely everybody that is working with you. You have to extend this trust. This is the only way. Yes. 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 Yeah. And if you extend trust, then then it builds trust in the, in the person that you're extending trust to. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Very good. Okay. So that's a great lesson. And that was a great point. Any Anything else that stands out in your, in your mind in terms of the... The, the, the kind of peaks of accomplishment or the... the... Yes. Yeah. I think that another realization that was very important for me is that there is no work-life balance. I mean, every time that I wanted to find work-life balance, I was miserable. Right. And each time that my life was my work and my work was my life, not in terms that my work is just what I do. No, my family... Yes. loves my work and understand, understands why I am doing what I am doing. And in my work, they understand how important my family is for me. So the priorities are parallel. You don't have to have one first priority. You can have your first A and first B priority, that is your family and your work, and you will be uh, shifting between them as you need. But then you have to have a very good network of support in the work that where vulnerability comes that you tell I will need your help in the work because there are times that I will need to be there for my family being them my parents being them my brother my siblings my my partner or my kids but here you guys have to help me in the work Mm -hmm. and I trust you I trust you that when I will show the fragility and the vulnerability to show the fragility that I need help here in the work because I have to focus in my family, you guys will have my back. At the same time in the family, when I need that time, because you know why I I choose this work and you know that I love my team, that I have to do for them, the same that I do for you guys, my family. So we are a team here also in the family and you back me up when I will need to spend more time far away from the family and even children. So not for the mothers that are traveling a lot, for example, not to, I, I bring a gift so my children will like that I travel because I come back and I give a gift. No, it's to tell the children, I am doing this because when you will grow up, mainly the, the girls, when you will grow up, you will want to have a husband and a family that supports you. Mommy is traveling because I love my job and I am doing good for other people. And I want to be the example for you guys because you have to do the same. But the time that I am with you, I am with you fully. So if I will summarize this is that my life, when my life became a life balance, right. and I was vulnerable in both, both uh, my spheres, mm. professional and private, And my purpose was clear for both because I wanted to help people. Mm. And then I had my network of support in both sides for me to excel in both sides was exactly when also I had my second shift in my happiness and success because I was not blaming myself to be too far away from the job because I was watching Uh, a presentation of my kids or I didn't feel bad with my kids that I was traveling for my work so this was the second very important realization Penny yeah I mean I think that that's that's a phenomenal position to come to and it's it's a position that not many leaders come to that actually that you can have an integrated life and that Mm -hmm. your work is part of your purpose of being here and your family is part of your purpose of being here so that you you are one person and that you give uh, your time and, and life to, to, to different things and that you create support systems inside both so that both can value each other even when you're with either one of them. So, I mean, I think that's quite a unique perspective that you've created because I, I coach many leaders and not many leaders can come to that kind of uh, realization. Mm -hmm. I think uh, many men come to this perspective faster or quicker or easier, but I don't Mm -hmm. think many women have have come to, there's always, there's often been this kind of conflict of being, to be there or there. And- It's uh, the guilty. They start to be guilt about doing it. And and 
no women should be guilty yes. of doing both. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Because, well, guilt in, in, in anyone is not a good thing to have yes. at all. So that's brilliant. So was there a, a, a third um, very important accomplishment or realization that you have won through your experience? Well, um, from what I can recall right now, I think that these two were the most important ones. And uh, if I would have just to complement this would be just when I understood that spirituality or meaning or purpose or whatever you call mm. has to be part of your life in the work and at home. Right. So this was, if I could tell that this is something that would come together with the second realization and also the first real, real, realization. Life balance, mm. uh, a kind of uh, a kind of uh, life balance. I think that comes together a lot with you having a very clear purpose. Yes. Yeah. And, 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 and having this spirituality. Purpose. Yes. Yes. Yeah, because I really believe that uh, things became clear for me. They didn't. They, they, they did. They didn't become easier, or they didn't become like, a, um, you know, like a, they didn't flow as everybody would think. Yes. But the clarity brought to me a very clear path. Right. So I, I could see when I was not in the path and I could yeah. see when I had to go to another direction. Right. So I think that always coming back to your purpose. Why are you here? Why are you doing this? So having a very clear, living an intentional life. Right. Absolutely. No, I like those words, living an intentional life. And, and, and that's been in you from when I met you in Hungary in 2004. So, so definitely, and those some of the conversations we had was all around, you know, your purpose and, and the meaning of what you were doing. Um, so if I was to ask you then, um, on the other side of that, if you look back at your career, what would you say was the biggest disappointment? Oh, the biggest disappointment. I think that all of my biggest disappointments uh, were exactly the opposite as my what what I told that it was my first uh, my first uh, accomplishment or learning that uh, my boss believed in me and then I could do everything. I think my disappointments were when bosses didn't understand what I was doing. Right. So it is very difficult for you to live an intentional life and work with spirituality, believe in people if you work in a multinational company and you are working directly with somebody that is very, very much numbers driven and it's very much like um, driven on with pure results. Mm. Because then, because normally the way that I work takes a little longer to, for, for you to see results. I was super fortunate that like 98% uh, of my, my, the people that I worked with me understood what I was telling, or even if they didn't understand that they gave me the chance to do it. Yes. But uh, I think that the biggest disappointments, probably I could tell that I had two disappointments in my whole professional career. Both of them were related to uh, you having to fight to live your life the way that you believe and working uh, the way that you believed, being forced to do things a different way without clear explanation, just for the sake of a uh, probable uh, ambition of having a short term result, a quicker mm -hmm. result. So I think that these were the disappointments because I believe in human beings and I believe that absolutely everybody uh, is able to understand what I'm doing. And I always think that people, when they understand what I am doing, 
they will at least let me, I don't, okay, I don't know exactly what you're doing, but understand what you want to do. So I will give you a chance and I will back you up. So many bosses told this to me, but the, the time that uh, I felt that people were like uh, trying to impose ways on my way, they took the worst out of me because I start to fight. And when you are daring, I heard this morning something, I was reading something from the Dao. If you have to fight when you are daring, you are not daring anymore. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, because you're engaged in something else. <laughs> yes. Yes, you're stopped and, uh, and yes. having to deal with, with the conflict. Um, so would you say that you've encountered prejudice in your career of the kind of male, female kind? Look, uh, if, if I would give a simple uh, answer, it would be yes. Uh, I will give a different way, a different answer. I, I encountered many people that were super successful in the way that the world was in the past. Right. People who lived in a time that uh, everything was done in a certain way. And these people were super successful. And even, um, even if we good intention, because they wanted to change me or they wanted to teach me that my way was not the right way because they were successful. So I encountered, yes, Penny, many people that try to, try to give me advice and try to change me because their way was successful for 20, 30 years. Yeah. And uh, this, I think that what I see today is that prejudice is nothing more of you trying to do things as you did in the past and as you are used to, and you do not go out of your comfort zone. And sometimes when we uh, arrive, people that do things differently, uh, we have also to have this consciousness that is difficult for people to understand you. Uh, this is not an excuse to accept or to conform, yeah. but this is a realization that helps you to be less frustrated and be more perseverant and to have more resilience. Sure, sure. Yeah, I, I can never see that you were ever stopped or, or could believe that you would be stopped. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I could see that you might encounter this kind of prejudice or worldview that was very different to yours. And how did you find that you you coped with it or you handled it when you encountered it? So uh, there were two times that I could not handle it. And then it was one time that I changed my first company and the second time that I changed my career. Oh. So these two times I could not cope with it. And maybe uh, one, I could not cope with it. And the other one, the, probably the other person could not cope with it. So it was two times that not. But in... 27 years, like 50 years, it was only two times. Right. Because all the other, it was, it was a question of patience. Patience is a virtue. Mm. And uh, I, I, I learned something that, um, and it was after lots of mistakes. First, you try to understand the person. Mm. If you try to understand the person, the person will understand you. Mm. So if you are trying to make a point, the first step is to understand the point of the other person and listen. And uh, many times I had people telling that, okay, Lara, I just believe in you, but I do not understand what you are doing. I cannot understand what you were telling, but from my heart, I know that I have to follow you. These were the moments that I didn't feel so well because it is super nice for your ego because people trust you. And, but the other side is that, what if I am not right? So these dialogues are very important. So that's why it's very important to, to, when somebody has a different opinion from you, because you have very different opinion, that you learn to listen and integrate this opinion in your opinion. But at the same time, it's like this thin line, when you do not give in, 
when you know that you were right and people were just trying to change you or do things for the sake of changing. But it's very difficult when you are a woman and you are in positions that you make decisions, but you have to report these decisions. And people can lose their 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 jobs because of this. Right, right. And and when you say it when when you get into a situation where people are not understanding you, it doesn't feel well. You don't feel well. They trust you, but actually they don't really understand. Do you do you ever you, it sounded like you then doubt yourself because mm -hmm. they're trusting you, but actually because they're not understanding you, you're, you're, you, doubt, you doubt yourself. So how much of self-doubt has been a feature? And it sounded like in the two instances that you've talked about, you left that scenario. You had to leave, firstly, you left your company and the second one, you left the career, <laughs> which seems a bit ex you know, extreme, um, but that is definitely, often the route that many people will take that say well actually I don't get you you don't get me I'm out of here and because if you don't share the same purpose then you know, then you have to leave um, looking back on that now do you think there was a different route that you could have taken is there something that you could have done or that that you think they should have done to have created a different scenario for you Um, I will answer in two different ways because I think that uh, one way is the way that I think uh, and um, it's more in a much bigger scenario but another one is exactly also for other people to give advice to people when they are in this situation and, and I will explain how I will sure. <laughs> do it. So the first one is that I truly believe that there are some things in life that happen because they have to happen. The wow. first time, if I would have not left my first job, I would not have this incredible seven years in rush. I would not. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So it was my decision. The second time, it was not my decision. My boss asked me to leave the company because I was not being able to fulfill his expectations. Yeah. Right. And at that moment, it's like um, for me, it was also, I would never leave Roche because Roche is a company who has, is exactly the company that I dreamt of as a multinational because they have purpose they allow you to do what you would like to do as a leader but always depends on who is your superior always because rush is so good and allows everybody to really do what they believe and they believe in their leaders if you have a conflict this will always happen so in this situation, it was very good because I could start a new career. So in my mind, I always think that even the worst thing comes for the good. But this was my first, this is my first answer. But if I would look back and tell, okay, if I wanted to continue in Bayer or in Rush, is there anything that, he, that I could do? Yes, there would be. There would be thousand things that I could do. And among them, like... Uh, being more patient myself mm. uh, and accepting certain things that I probably would not agree at that moment for the sake of just being there and being able to help the people and the team mm. to go through this moment and be able to keep defending what I believed. Right. Yeah. So this is like, this was my two biggest um fights in the two situations the first situation because i would have to leave my team i almost didn't accept the position in rush and the second i just gave in very quickly for my team not to be in this damage of discussions and conflicts in my in the moment that i was leaving mm. so yeah I could have been a little more there to defend everything and everybody can have more patience or whatever. But I think that there is something inside that tells you what to do. If you are doing things with purpose and you are kind of connected with your, yes. your consciousness, you will know what you have to do. 
Yeah. And it, 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 you, ha you don't have any kind of bitterness or regret about the decisions that you've taken in, in the, you know, in reaction to the disappointments that you encountered. You feel that it's... Even, that even the, no, the contrary. Is, it, Penny, I tell you, I tell you, for, for my children's sake, yeah. I meditate with the two persons that were like the trigger of my biggest changes. I meditate for them to be as happy as I am and for them to find themselves as much as I found because of them. Because of them, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Because, because yeah. They, they, our biggest obstacles and challenges in our lives are our biggest lessons. I think that's it's our blessings. Yeah, yeah, exactly. They're the sometimes the most difficult things that you've ever encountered. A, are the biggest learning uh, and lessons that you get, but also the great, greatest shifts of change that you can make in your life. So, so yes. And, and it sounds like you're very grateful for the changes that have happened. Yes. Yeah. Brilliant. Okay, that's, that's fantastic. Um, so do you feel and probably this this uh, question is is irrelevant do you feel that you were ever felt that you had to compromise or were silenced or were put down because you were a woman in 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 the workplace um you know penny that uh, it's the it's the second time in my life that somebody asked this question the first time i told no um but then uh, it was like uh, probably uh, six or seven years ago that somebody asked it and I told no. But right now, looking back, because of the way that I am, that I see always the positive in things. Mm. And because also the family, like my mother was Japanese and the Japanese tradition is a lot of uh, avoiding conflict. No, it's, it's not, not avoiding conflict, but living in peace. Living in peace, yeah, so, and, and, and so, a lot so of the, women have this same print. Yes, not just Japanese and, uh, women. There were and and there were not not one two times. There were like thousand times that I have just to shut up because because I remember even I, I tell you something very funny. There was uh, one super meeting that it was all of the general managers, and our boss he wanted to train us in unconscious bias. And they brought a trainer to train us on it. And I, it, I, I, I was, I think at that time, I was the only GM, female GM. No, no, me and another colleague. It was the only two female uh, GMs at that time and that meeting. There were other females that were from other positions, um, but GMs were just us. And then this lady tells that the women are more, is are three times more interrupted than men. And that uh, also uh, males tend to finish phrases of women and get the, the um, accomplishment of the thought or the idea because they agree with the women and they put in their words, ideas of women. So they, they, she was telling something like this and she was telling that during the whole day, she would kind of, she would like us proactively that each time that a woman would be interrupted that they just stopped it. And then it was like, a, and after one hour, the men were feeling very strange because they got to observe how many times they interrupted the women and how how the women could not talk unless they were aggressive <laughs> so and i remember that uh, a word a uh, phrase that i used to repeat a lot penny a lot is that okay let me just finish and then you go yes. this was this was a phrase that i learned that i learned as any position that i had that it was like more men than women, but yeah. all of them. <laughs> so all, all I the learned, time. I, all means, of them. So your whole I career. Learned that, <laughs> and this phrase was like, uh, "Please let me finish, and then you go." Or please do not interrupt me. Let me just finish my idea. You know. So it's like uh, I remember that uh, I was told aggressive. I was told being aggressive because I asked people 
not to interrupt me. <laughs> <You're right. laughs> so, because by the end, you have, if and it's terrible because at least in my period, my 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 era, <laughs> when I I had to face this, you had to be aggressive in a nice way. So yeah. sometimes I told, okay, let me finish. So, so so I and when I didn't have patience, I was just kind of sorry, but fed up. You know, yeah. end of the day. Okay, let me just finish. Yeah. But uh, uh, how many times people just they just no, but you know what? And then I just okay. Okay. And these are this is a very small example, yeah. Yeah. This is a very small example because of course, how many times I had an idea and I had something and I had just to step back. But this is woman and man. Yeah. Every everybody. Yes. But I wanted to give the example of interrupting because it was a very clear, proven example of that moment that I can bring here for everybody also to observe how many times women are interrupted and men are interrupted. Yeah. And why do women become very aggressive when they are in the power position among men? Is because of their nature, because women are more aggressive as leaders, or because they have to keep their their space I have to keep in the conversation. So yeah. this is a, this is a, I don't I don't know what is the answer, but I would like everybody to observe it. Okay, very good. And, and so yeah, I think I think you're expressing the view of many many women, and you know it's just the norm that we have had to live in in order to fight for our space, to fight for our time in order to express ourselves and to express our views. So thank you very much for, for doing that. So um, I think I have only one more question to ask you. Um, and, um, you know, we're doing these interviews really not just for ourselves, but for other women, particularly perhaps some younger women who would like to sort of uh, listen to someone who has gone before them. and. Uh, has won some space for themselves um, in the world. So if I was to ask you, what, um, what three lessons or pieces of advice would you give uh, women today who are either at the start or midway through their career um, drawn from your experience? So I would probably give the example that I, I would base on my experience, that I, the, the, the question that you had before. So the first thing is um, build your life based on people that believe in you. And just learn from people that do not believe in you. So there will be both people in your life and it's your choice which one to focus, which one to make it the bigger part of your life. So take the people that believe in you, being it a parent, being it a sibling, uh, a boss, but look a lot at people that believe in you. Mm -hmm. People that put you down, they are also important. You should not just give up on them or, but it's very important that you do not live for these people. Right. You listen to them, you learn from them. They are, they feed your learning, but they do not feed your ego. Right. So this is super important. So this would be one lesson that I would, would give. The second um, would be really do not try to find a work-life balance. Look at you, uh, your life as an integral part as a, at, at its integrality. Mm -hmm. So do not try to find a balance between work and life, mainly because we women, we cannot have it. We cannot have it anyway, because uh, you will always, always have a time that if, for example, if you decide to get married, you will have to take care of your husband. And when the husband is taking care of their wives, it's beautiful, it's caring, they are better bosses because they take care of their, their, their wives. But a woman, it's like, oh, she's submissive. 
Mm. Or she, it's like, a, it's the different perspective. And when you have children, even more, you will have to give time to your children. And you have to see your life and find balance in your life. Know that there is a period of your life that you do not have, um, you do not have such a big commitment in your private life. So you dedicate to your professional life. Mm -hmm. But thinking on your private life and giving the space for it to emerge. When you have a very big commitment in your private life, be sure that you had used very well your time that you were dedicating to the profession, not to tell that you were super powerful and that you can do everything, but to find the right net of support and finding people that can work with you. So you will be supported when you have to find the balance on the other side. But your life will be a balance where at a certain point you will dedicate more your, to your profession, another to your private, and it is okay if this will take five, six years, or even 10 years, that you have to have a balance that is more professional or more private. Each one will know. But be sure that you are doing all of this because of the third lesson. Right. That you know the meaning, the purpose that you have in your life. Even when you're getting married, you are building a family, or you're changing a company, you were not doing because you want to avoid something because you were uh, frustrated. Be sure that whatever you are doing, even if it is being born from a frustration or unhappiness, that whatever you will decide and you will do, will be focused on something that has meaning in your life and in your purpose. Because then you will be, it will be much easier for you to find people that believe in you and find this balance in your life. So it would be these three lessons that I would give. <laughs> brilliant, brilliant. And, and it's, it's, uh, it's amazing, actually, because it feels like uh, it, we've had a circular conversation because this is where we started, the meaning and purpose of your life and, and um, where we first engaged in our conversations. And uh, those are really excellent three pieces of advice that I can see that you've come to because of your life and and the approach that you've taken so you know congratulations on the impact um, that you've made in the world already and the changes that you have given to 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 the many people that you've led in your career and I'm sure they're incredibly grateful that they have had the opportunity to work with you and I had uh, very good people that came in my life in the right time to tell me that I am doing the things in the right way and to share their way so I could learn. People like you, Penny. Oh, thank, thank you, you a so lot. <laughs> thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank you. Um, and uh, goodbye for now. I'll um, just uh, stop the recording. Thank you, Lara. I really, really thank enjoyed you. it. It's, it's uh, it was a phenomenal interview and I really appreciated all the wisdom that you've brought to bear. I love the conversation. Thank you so much, Penny.